it's time for another prophetic field trip. In chapters 18 and 19, the Lord sends Jeremiah actually on two different prophetic field trips. We've seen in the last few months how weird it was to be a prophet like Jeremiah in the Old Testament. How weird and often painful it was because of how different he was called to be and how painful his message was to deliver and to receive. Like the time that Jeremiah was sent to buy a linen belt and then travel 700 miles round trip to bury the belt and then travel 700 miles round trip back to unbury the belt and then parade it around town just to make a prophetic point about how the nation of Judah was ruined. Well, this time, Jeremiah is not sent on his field trip to a clothing store, but to the pottery barn, to the workshop of the craftsmen that lived there. Chapter 18, verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. Go down to the potter's house. I wonder what we're going to learn there. In this first field trip, in chapter 18, Jeremiah is not called to do anything except watch the work of this potter and learn a lesson from it about who God is. Now, a potter, a craftsman who makes pottery out of clay, was not an unusual thing in those days. It was common and normal. You and I often have to go to a special event like an arts festival to see someone make pottery with their own hands. Raise your hand if you have seen somebody make pottery with their own hands. Okay, most of us have done that. How many of you have made pottery with your own hands? Raise your hand if you've done that. Yeah, a few of you have done that. Yeah. Okay, so you know exactly what this is all about. Back in Jeremiah's day, this was the main way you could get items to hold things like a jar or a cup or a bowl. You didn't buy them at Target. You went to the home of a craftsman who made them by hand, out of clay. It took special skill, but everybody had seen somebody do it. And Yahweh now sends Jeremiah, we're not exactly sure when, what year, probably early in his ministry, to visit a potter's house, watch him do his work, and wait for the Lord's message. And that's exactly what he does. Look at verse 3. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Now, from what I understand, this wheel is actually two round stones, kind of a big one at the bottom and a smaller one at the top, with a vertical post tying the two of them together. And the potter would, is very whole body kind of craft. The potter would use his feet to move the bottom stone around in a circle, which moved the top stone where he put his wet clay and he's shaping it and form it on that top stone, which is the potter's wheel. And it's turning on that. Okay. Do you see it in your mind's eye? Probably not from my motions up here, but you've seen it uh, in person. So you have an idea. The clay is wet. The clay is moldable, it's shapeable, it's pliant at this point. And the potter has something nice that he intends to make out of it. Nobody says this morning, I'm going to go make some junk in my potter's house, right? They're all, they always have in, something in mind, something nice that they're going to make. But something goes wrong in the process. Verse 4 said, the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. Now, that word for marred is the same word he used in chapter 13 to describe how the linen belt was ruined. It was defective. It was malformed. It was spoiled. It had gone bad. It was not right. How did that affect the potter? Did it stop him? Did it foil him? Was that the end of his day? Was that the end of his career? No, we're kind of laughing, chuckling at the idea. Was he forced to just finish the pot with that glaring problem sticking out there unfixed? No. Verse 4 says rather nonchalantly, 
So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Okay. Seems pretty simple, right? Well, right there, right then, Jeremiah saw what he was supposed to prophesy. Verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. All of a sudden, the picture becomes focused. There's a deep symbolism going on here. The clay stands for something. The clay stands for the people of Israel. And the potter stands for something too. The potter is the Lord himself. Oh, wow. That could go in a lot of directions, couldn't it? In fact, it does go in different directions in different parts of the Bible. This is not the only time when the Lord is likened to a potter and the people are likened to pottery. In the second chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, it says that the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground. That word formed is the same word as verse 4. God was acting like a potter when he made the first man. And it just goes on from there. Throughout the Bible, the Lord is likened to a potter and people are likened to pottery. And different parts of the Bible emphasize different parts of that analogy. But all of them put us in our place and place him in his. He is the potter. We are the clay. We are not equals. We are not rivals. We are in his hands. If it makes you feel kind of small to think of yourself as clay and him as the potter, then you're reading it right. Verse 6 again. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of a potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. This emphasizes the power of God. The bigness of God. It emphasizes the position of God. It emphasizes the sovereignty of God. It emphasizes the freedom of God. The power and freedom of God to bring about justice. Because you know what justice is? Justice is fixing what is broken in the world. Justice is making things right once again. Justice is doing what is right and fixing what is unright in our broken world. Like when that potter saw how the pot was going wrong, while it was still wet in his hands, and he pushed it down and bunched it all up and started over again. Shaping it, it says, as it seemed best to him. I have three points this morning, and they're all about the Lord and his relationship to justice. Doing what is right and fixing what is wrong. Here's the first one. The Lord is able to bring justice. Number one, the Lord is able to bring justice because he is the potter. In verses 7 through 10, the Lord presents a couple of case studies to show us what he means by saying that he's like a potter. And in them, he emphasizes that he's free to change direction based on the situation. Look at verse 7. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. You see what he's saying there? Does does that language sound familiar to you? I hope it does by now. Uprooted. That's the title of our whole sermon series on Jeremiah. In the very first chapter of Jeremiah's prophecy, the Lord put these words into Jeremiah's mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy, same word, and overthrow, to build and to plant. And the Lord says that if he announced that a nation or a kingdom, that's Israel, Judah, or even a foreign pagan nation in these days, were to repent of its evil, 
then he would be free as the potter to pull back his judgment. And we know that he did that in the Old Testament, don't we? Remember the prophecy of Jonah? Jonah is sent to Nineveh. He does not want to go to Nineveh. Why? Because he hates the Ninevites. And he's supposed to say to them, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And he just knows what's going to happen. They're going to repent. And they do. And what does the Lord do? He relents. He doesn't send the judgment on Nineveh. Jonah's unhappy about that. But we should be very happy about that. Who changed there? Did the Lord change? No, they changed. And it meant that everything was fixed. So the potter could take the clay in a different direction. But the opposite is also true. Verse 9. And if at any other time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Like if the clay has a mind of its own, so to speak, and it starts to become an evilly defective pot, then the potter is free and able to smash it down and start all over again. And the clay cannot object, right? Hey, hey, wait, 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 potter, wait, wait. You said you were going to plant us and build us. Up, you gave us a covenant. You made us promises. Take your hands off of us. Until you're going to tell us that you're not going to mess with us. You gave us the Ten Commandments. You gave us the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You said you were going to make a certain kind of pot out of us. You can't change your plan now. We are the clay and we demand our rights. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. If they go wrong, the Lord is able to bring justice. He's able to fix things as he sees best. And he certainly sees best. So this is a warning, isn't it? Judah should not presume on anything. Instead, they should repent while they still can. Verse 11, Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says, Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. Now, what we don't get is that the Hebrew word for devising in verse 11 is the same word as shaping or forming from verse 4. The potter. The potter is forming up a disaster to strike the people of Judah as a judgment on their wicked ways. He is more than able to bring justice. And he's warning them to repent while they still have time while the clay is still wet. And that's true for you and me as well. We should repent while we still can. Have you turned from your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have not, I challenge you to do so right here and right now because the Lord is able to bring justice and you and I on our own will not survive His justice. And don't think he won't do it. Do not presume upon his mercy. Do not think that you have some kind of an inside track that goes around repentance. I'll just skip that step. He'll forgive me. That's what God does. He's in the business of forgiving people. Don't think that you're going to argue your way out of this. Or spin it. Or fool him. You and I are just clay. We're not the potter. We do not have a say. Repent. Verse 11 again. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions while the clay is still wet. I love how it says each one of you. So the nation may go one direction, but the individual person can still go the Lord's way. 
And even if we've repented of our sins and trusted in Jesus as our Savior, He is still calling us to keep on repenting and keep reforming our ways and our actions. By faith, we're called to cooperate with His reshaping work in our lives. In what ways are you repenting these days? That's another one of the kind of ideas behind being the clay, moldable in His hands, allowing Him to shape us into what He wants us to be. Sadly, the people of Judah were committed to the, their evil ways and refused to repent. Look at what they said to the Lord after the Lord called them to himself. Verse 12, but they will reply, it's no use. We will continue with our own plans. Each of us will follow the stubbornness of his evil heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. This is his reply. Inquire among the nations. Who's ever heard anything like this? A most horrible thing has been done by virgin Israel. Does the snow of Lebanon ever vanish from its rocky slopes? No. Do its cool waters from distant sources ever cease to flow? No. That'd be weird and unnatural. Yet my people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless idols, which made them stumble in their ways and in the ancient paths. They made them walk in bypaths and on roads not built up. He's pointing out how illogical and ridiculous Judah's sin is. Sin is crazy. Sin is insane. Why would you do that? Why would you give up Yahweh for worthless idols? The clay has gone bad, but the potter is able to fix it. He's able to bring justice. Verse 16, their land will be laid waste. An object of lasting scorn. All who pass by will be appalled and will shake their heads. Like a wind from the east, I will scatter them before their enemies. I will show them my back and not my face in the day of their disaster. Whew, how scary is that? But that's justice. You remember what the Lord told them he was going to do in Numbers chapter 6? Put his name on them. He said, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. That was the plan. That was what was on the potter's wheel from the beginning for Israel. But now he says, I will turn my face and my back. You will not see my face. Repent while you still can. I've been talking recently about my wrestling with gluttony. But my wife has recently put her finger on a different worthless idol, which has been causing me to stumble in recent days. And that's the idol of productivity. I love to get things done. I love to produce things. I love to be productive. And that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with getting things done or wanting to get things done or enjoying getting things done. And yet it still can become an idol, can't it? Productivity can become a false god that you begin to bow down to and worship when getting things done is everything. And you can't be happy unless you are. When you're not getting things done ruins everything. When you take it out on others, when you aren't productive. These are signs that productivity has become an idol. My wife said to me this week, stop bowing at the idol of productivity. Thank you, Heather Joy. It's been hard for me during this season of our church's life when we don't have that many programs anymore. We used to have something for everyone and three programs for some people. But that's not what the Lord has called us to right now as a church. And I'm having to learn to rest and wait and watch him do his work in his way and his timing. What idols are you wrestling with right now? Might not be productivity at all. But what is it that's leading you down the wrong path? What changes are you allowing the potter to make in your life right now as he desires to reshape you? In verse 18, the people of Judah decide that they're tired of hearing Jeremiah's message and conspire to harm him. Look at verse 18. They said, come, let's make plans against Jeremiah 
For the teaching of the law by the priest will not be lost, nor will counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophets. So come, let's attack him with our tongues and pay no attention to anything he says. Again, the the defective clay presumes that they can get away with whatever they want. Obviously, the Lord's not going to take away all the priests or the sages or the prophets just because we get rid of Jeremiah. He's going to keep on doing that. Let's get Jeremiah in trouble with the law. Let's attack him in the courts with our mouths and disregard him with our ears. Man, does that hurt Jeremiah. Jeremiah took this personally because it was personal. I mean, they were coming after Yahweh, but in doing so, they were coming after him. And all this is just compounding his pain. He's not just doing weird things or being the odd man out. He's being attacked left and right by the very people he's trying to help. So what do you do when you're attacked? And you're godly. You take it to the Lord in prayer, right? That's what he does. And when he prays, once again, it sounds like a psalm. It's a song about justice. Look at verse 19. Listen to me, O Lord. Hear what my accusers are saying. Should good be repaid with evil? No. Yet they've dug a pit for me. Remember that I stood before you and spoke in their behalf to turn your wrath away from them. So go ahead. So give their children over to famine. Hand them over to the power of the sword. Let their wives be made childless and widows. Let their men be put to death. Their young men slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses when you suddenly bring invaders against them. For they've dug a pit to capture me and have hidden snares for my feet. But you, O Lord, but you know, O Lord, all their plots to kill me. Do not forgive their crimes or blot out their sins from your sight. Let them be overthrown before you. Deal with them in the time of your anger. Whew. Wow. Okay, let me ask you. Is that a good prayer? Hmm. We've seen that Jeremiah can go too far. How about this one? Is this a good prayer? Should we pray like this ourselves? Well, there is a lot that's good about this prayer. For one, Jeremiah does not hold his heart back. He tells the Lord exactly what he's feeling and thinking. He acknowledges the pain and the injustice that he feels. You know, O Lord. Have you ever prayed that? You know, O Lord. You know. And it's also good that he doesn't say, watch this, Lord. I'm going to get those guys. Hold my beer. Here goes my vengeance. Jeremiah does not go for vigilante justice. He doesn't take things into his own hands. He takes this request for justice to the one who can do something about it and will do the right thing about it. He goes to the potter who's able to bring justice to fix what's broken. And that's what's especially good about this prayer. This is a prayer for justice. Let's make this point number two. Point number one was the Lord is able to bring justice. Point number two is the Lord has been asked to bring justice. The Lord has been asked to bring justice. If justice is fixing what is broken in this world, then Jeremiah is saying, these actions of my accusers are what's broken in this world, Lord. Please fix it. This is a cry for justice, and that is good and right. Jeremiah has been pouring out his life for his neighbors, and what he has gotten is just evil in return. So here he is deciding to go ahead and change what he's asking for. Go ahead, Lord. Bring the disasters you said were on the way. Bring them down on their heads. It is not wrong to pray for justice to be done. In fact, it's good and right. Your will be done here on earth as it's done in heaven. There are many psalms that sound like this, and they give us an example of how to pray for justice. And there are New Testament prayers kind of like this as well. 
I think, for example, the book of Revelation, the souls of the martyrs that are under the altar, and they pray, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Those are people that were killed for following Jesus, and they're saying, Lord, bring justice. How long do we have to wait? So it's good and right to pray for justice. But there's also something better. And Jesus showed us the way to that. Because when Jesus was attacked, he prayed, Father, forgive them. And he taught us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And he didn't say, Stop when they reach the point, this one point. So this is a good prayer. But there's an even better way to pray, perhaps on top of it. Ask the Lord if they will not repent to bring justice on your enemies, but keep praying that they will repent. Keep praying that they will find what you have found. Mercy. And whatever you do, do not repay evil for evil. Remember what we learned in 1 Peter. Return beatings with blessings. Remember what Paul said in Romans 12, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It'd be so easy to slip from praying like Jeremiah does into hating them. And that's not the way of the Christian. But yes, also cry out to the Lord for justice. Because we know that he is able to bring justice and that he will certainly do so. And that is our last point. Point number three. The Lord will assuredly bring justice. The Lord is able. The Lord has been asked. And the Lord will most assuredly bring justice because that's who he is. He is the potter. Which brings us to Jeremiah chapter 19 and his second prophetic field trip down to the potter's house. Look with me at verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Go and buy a clay jar from a potter. Take along some of the elders of the people and of the priests and go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom near the entrance of the potsherd gate. There proclaim the words I tell you and say. Now stop there for a second before we see what he's supposed to say. This is another occasion. That's why there's chapter 18 and then there's chapter 19. Now, it might have been soon after the first, but my guess is that this was actually much later. And Jeremiah's kind of mashing them up together because we're going to get some of the potter's sermons in the same places and the fallout from it. The first one was when the clay was wet, probably earlier in his ministry. From the sounds of what happens in chapter 19, this is later. This is closer to the end of Jeremiah's 40 years of being a broken record about a broken covenant. Jeremiah is sent to a potter's house again, this time to buy a finished jar. This one is hard. It's been fired. And maybe has a nice glaze over it. It's set to go. It's useful. It's ready to be used. Now, the Hebrew for clay jar is, listen to this, bakbok, okay? And I think it's probably named for what it sounds like. So when the lid is poured out, when the liquid is poured out, it goes bakbok, 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 right? What's, what do you got there? Bakbok, right? It's, we have, at home, we have one, it's actually called a gluggle jug, right? So again, the same sound, gluggle, 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 gluggle. So Jeremiah is told to buy a jar, a clay jar, a bakbok, and take it to the valley of Ben-Hinnom. And he's not to go alone this time. He's to bring a bunch of leaders with him. I'm sure they did not want to go. I, I don't know how he talked them into it. Jeremiah's got no power in this world. In fact, he's being attacked left and right. And if this is towards the end of his ministry, he has even less, as we will see next week. But the Lord wants witnesses for what he's about to say with this Bach book. And he drags these witnesses out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom, later called Gehenna, 
modern day Wadi Arababi on the western and southern end of Jerusalem to the gate called the Potsherd Gate. In other words, the town dump. This is where they put the shards of pots that are ruined and unusable. A potsherd is not like a shepherd, somebody who herds pots, right? A potsherd is a, a broken pot. It's a shard of a pot. This is, where, this, this is the dump. This is where they put all those unusable shards of pottery. A great big pile. And Jeremiah brings them out to that spot with his bok book. And in my mind, it's full of liquid. Maybe wine, maybe water. And he begins to preach. And you know by now what he's going to say. Verse 5, verse 3. Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and people of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Listen, I'm going to bring a disaster on this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. For they have forsaken me and made this a place of foreign gods. They've Canaanized the land of Judah. They have burned sacrifices in it to gods that neither they nor their fathers nor the, the kings of Judah ever knew. And they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. They built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as offerings to Baal. Something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. It's unthinkable. So beware, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call this place Topheth, place of fire, or the valley of Ben-Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. Not only did you slaughter the innocents in this place, but you will be slaughtered here as well. In this place, I will ruin the plans of Judah and Jerusalem. Stop there for just a second. That word for ruin in Hebrew is, catch this, Bakak, right? Bakak. It means to empty or to spoil or to run out. It sounds a lot like the word for the clay jar, right? Bakbuk. What do you do with a bakbuk? You bakak. Some scholars think, and I would not be surprised to find out that at this moment in his message, Jeremiah poured out the liquid from this jar, dramatically symbolizing the judgment that was going to be poured out on Judah. I will make them fall by the sword before their enemies at the hands of those who seek their lives and I will give their carcasses as food to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. I will devastate this city and make it an object of scorn. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of all of its wounds. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and daughters and they will eat one another's flesh during the stress of the siege imposed on them by the enemies who seek their lives. All of that happened. Read the book of Lamentations. That all happened in 588 to 586 B.C. to Judah. Babylon was coming. The siege was coming. Exile was coming. They were going to be uprooted. His judgment was going to be poured out on them. And then the Lord said, verse 10, Then break the jar while those who go with you are watching. I'm not going to do that this morning. That's Heather Joyce. And it was a gift from one of you. And Cindy would never forgive me. But just imagine a thousand pieces where that jar hit. All those other jars and smashed and splintered everywhere. Verse 11, and say to them, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. They will bury the dead in Topheth until there's no more room. This is what I will do to this place and to those who live here, declares the Lord. I will make this city like Topheth. The whole place will become a dump. Jerusalem will become a dump. The houses in Jerusalem and those of the kings of Judah will be defiled like this place, Topheth. All the houses where they burn incense on the roofs to all the starry hosts and poured out drink offerings to the other gods. 
Jeremiah then returned from Topheth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and stood in the court of the Lord's temple and said to all the people, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Listen, I am going to bring on this city and the villages around it every disaster I pronounced against them because they were stiff-necked and would not listen to my words. Those words are going to get Jeremiah into a heap of trouble. We'll read about it, Lord willing, next week in chapter 20. There will be great fallout. And Jeremiah Jeremiah may hit a new bottom with how it all makes him feel. But everything he says as he smashes that clay jar from the potter's house is absolutely true. The Lord will assuredly bring Justice. Judah has done all these things and refused to repent of them. They've become set in their ways like hardened clay, and the potter here will throw them out of, onto the potsherd pile of history. And that will be right. That will be justice. So, yes, that's scary. But it's also wonderful, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful to know that God will always do what is right? You don't want a God who doesn't do what's right. You don't want to live in that universe. Isn't it wonderful to know that God will bring justice and fix everything? I don't know about you, but I think there's a lot of injustice in this world right now. Have you seen it on the news? Things are not as they should be. Think about everything that's wrong right now in your world. And not just physical evil like earthquakes and famines and things like that. Think about unjust wars. Think about racism. Think about child abuse. Think about fraud, thievery, robbery. Think about domestic violence. Think about abortion on demand. Think about human trafficking. Think about how you have been wronged by others. And right now, the best of justice is just approximation at its best. There's so much injustice in this world. But the Lord is a perfect potter. He is able to bring justice. He is free and sovereign and wise and in a position to make things right. And he has been asked to bring justice. And we continue to ask him to bring justice. It is right to do so. And he has promised that he will bring perfect justice. He will right every wrong. He will balance every scale. He will fix everything that is broken, which includes bringing the smash on the things that need smashed. Read the book of Revelation. So yes, this is a call to repent because justice is surely coming, but it is also a call to rest because justice is surely coming. That's how we can love our enemies, right? Non-Christians can't really do that. I mean, why would they? Because we know that vengeance is the Lord's and he will repay. Nobody gets away with anything. If it seems like your enemy is getting away with it, don't worry, they won't. You can rest. Leave it in the Lord's hands. Pray for justice. Work towards justice. But don't take justice into your own hands. Love your enemies. You can do it because the Lord will most assuredly bring the smash to things that need smashed. Just wait. And also, rejoice. This truth is worth rejoicing in because we know that God will bring ultimate justice to our broken world. And we know that because of what we saw Jesus do for us on the cross. In case you're worried because you know how many injustices you have caused your own self, the Lord Jesus was smashed in your place. The Lord Jesus was shattered in mine. At the cross, Jesus took on himself the just wrath of God that you and I deserved. The potter became the clay. 
And he allowed himself to be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. Rejoice. Rejoice.